the teen years are a hard time for kids and parents. We really thought that the fights and the friction were normal until we realized that the secret was parenting after dark. After seven teenagers, here are the four things we did that changed everything. Welcome to the Cook Who Can't Eat podcast, where we're making food, family, and life a little easier, one bite at a time. Hello, my friend. I'm so glad that you're here. There's a magic that happens after dark, especially in parenting, and it can honestly change everything. When your babies are babies, it can feel like so much of your parenting is happening at night. 3 a.m. feedings, teething, nightmares, monsters in the closet, they're too excited, they have sniffles, or they just want extra cuddles. When they're old enough and they're finally sleeping through the night and feel like hitting the lottery, isn't it amazing what a full night's sleep can do? Then your kid decides they want to play sports or participate in activities. And for whatever reason, all of those sports tend to start at 7 a.m. or some other horrible early time taking away that luxurious morning sleep. But as they become tweens and teens, it suddenly flips on you. Things don't start at 7 a.m. anymore. They now start at 7 p.m. Your evenings and nights begin feeling like you started a second career working for Uber. Eventually, they're driving themselves. And while you're happy to retire from your taxi driver role, you quickly realize just how much time you're now losing with them. They may go to school before you wake up. And there were times when my daughter wouldn't even be home until after I was asleep at night, which meant there were entire days where I wouldn't even get to see her face. It's a cliche for a reason. In the grand scheme of things, you have about half a second to raise your babies to be good humans. Between life, work, and schedules, it can be hard to find time to have those hard and teachable conversations and harder still to find time when your teen or tween is actually open to real communication. You know what I'm talking about. When they're willing to talk with more than just a, yeah, a grunt fine, a head bob, or my personal favorite. I know. Okay, well, if you know, then why do I have to tell you? We really thought a lot of our fights and friction with our teens were just them being teens and trying to carve out their own independence. Well, that was true. It was actually the pandemic lockdowns that showed me what needed to happen. My parenting needed to start happening after dark. We already know that parenting is a 24-7, 365 job. But when it comes to teenagers, just like when they were babies, it seems like the real work begins after the sun sets. In those early teen years, when you're still their personal driver, take note of where their attention is during the ride. Usually on the way to their activity, they're buried in their phone, doing homework, or sometimes even zoning out. But interrupting any of those is a major faux pas. The drive home is a completely different story. If you're carpooling, this is when they tend to talk to each other the most. Keep an ear out because it's gold. (laughs) When it's just the two of you, they're probably visibly tired. They're more relaxed. And if you ask just right, that was when our teens would start talking, telling us stories about their lives and their friends, and even answering questions without all the teen-tude. Now, it didn't always work. There were a million factors to take into consideration, not least of which was how tired any of us were. Now, it was usually me that was exhausted. And while I've always been a night owl, sometimes that balancing act or those hard parenting moments are a lot for us parents at the end of an already busy day. Teenagers are more active at night. Research actually shows that their circadian rhythms shift during puberty, causing them to feel more alert and awake in the evening and night hours and more tired and sluggish during the day. It's like when they were infants and got their days and nights confused, but now that they're teens, it's called phase delay. During the day, they're busy with school, extracurricular activities, and friends. So when they come home, they usually disappear into their bedroom behind a closed door. However, as the night wears on or the day is coming to an end, teens often become more talkative, even with their parents 
because they're more relaxed and they start to let their guard down. What I found most interesting was that when we had those late night conversations in the car, they said more and shared more than they did when we would talk face to face. The dark car created this almost anonymous environment, kind of like a confessional. They can't see your facial expressions or your nonverbal cues, so they can't jump to conclusions or feel judged. They also know that you can't see their facial expressions, making it easier for them to say what they may not say otherwise. It's amazing. Obviously, we can't only or always talk to our teens and tweens in the car at night, especially once they start driving. So finding other ways to create those moments is important. My oldest was set to graduate in May of 2020. She left school for spring break and she never got to go back. Then I got sick. Then the world got sick. That period of time was full of so much heartache and tragedy. She lost so much in those months. We all did. However, it did give me a few gifts. One of the gifts that I am most grateful for was the extra time I had with my oldest and I didn't even have to ground her to get it. <laughs> what she and I gained over those months was magic. One of her jobs was at a grocery store, making her an essential employee. She would come home after work, clean up, sanitize everywhere, and eventually she'd show up in my room around midnight or 1 a.m. and talk. We would talk about everything and nothing. Since time and days no longer really existed at that point, Sometimes my youngest would even join us. While well, we played Uno sitting on my bed, we could talk about anything, even those touchy and sensitive topics. I'm not sure if it was the distraction of the game, that it was dark out, the room being dim, or they were more relaxed because it was the end of the day. But at night, we had magical conversations. We built bridges, we dreamed out loud, we healed old wounds, we laughed, we cried sometimes at the same time. We generally just enjoyed getting to know one another beyond the typical mother-child relationship. These conversations built wonderful connections between me and my kids and even between them. Those conversations are still some of my favorite times as a mom and best memories. Now that time and days do matter and she's away at school, oh man, do I miss those talks. Didn't always work. I had to be careful. Some days we would argue or disagree and if something was brought up the next day, boom, it would all blow up in my face. It was a balancing act. Trying to approach potentially sensitive topics or address concerns without triggering defensiveness or resistance. It's not easy to create an environment where teenagers will really share their thoughts and feelings, where you can listen without judgment, and you can offer constructive feedback and guidance without them reacting negatively. It's a hard balance to achieve. During those conversations, I realized that for years, we had been trying to parent on our schedule when it was convenient for us. And really, what I needed to do was just wait until after dark. If you are at all struggling to connect with your teen, try it. What's the worst that can happen? They can get mad at you? Okay. Open lines of communication, although essential, are only one part of parenting after dark. Friends are a very important part of your teen's life. Their days are so busy that their social lives happen at night, and that's when they feel more comfortable, relaxed, and ready to have fun. It's what made those late night chats work. Staying up late and socializing at night can also be a great way for teens to start asserting their independence and feel like they're in control of their own life. Stepping back to give your teen that space to make mistakes and learn from them is not easy. We know what we were like at that age, and we know there is a chance that they are doing things you really don't want them to be doing. Obviously, the first step is to have an open and honest conversation about the risks of these behaviors and establish clear rules, boundaries, expectations, and even lay out what the consequences are going to be. There's a good chance that this conversation will make them mad, but that's okay. Your job is not to make them happy all the time. Your job is to keep them safe, raise them to be good humans, and prevent them from making choices that could result in lifelong consequences for themselves or someone else. 
the dark makes it easier to have those hard conversations or admit things that you wouldn't in the light of day. However, it can also give your team a false sense of empowerment or fearlessness, and that can lead to them doing things they would not normally do. Once again, you're parenting after dark. It's hard when your babies are getting older and you're trying to find a balance between monitoring and supporting them and letting them develop their own independence and autonomy. It's scary knowing that there isn't a lot of direct supervision at night, but the good news is that they have started learning how to trust their own intuition at this point. It's your job to foster that and give them safe ways to eject in case of emergency. After seven teenagers, here are the three ways we have found the most success with that job. First, be the bad guy. And more importantly, make sure your child knows that you're okay playing that role. If they want to opt out of an invite without seeming lame, tell them to blame you. If they're out and they're just uncomfortable and they want to come home, but they don't want to be seen as ditching, tell them to blame you. If a bunch of them are deciding where to go or what to do in the selection just doesn't quite sit right with your kid, have them tell their friends that you don't allow them to go there. Take the blame. Be the bad guy. Who cares if their friends get mad at you or don't like you? Your kiddo will love you for it. Be the bad guy. Second, have a secret family code. This is a lot like being the bad guy, but with irrefutable proof. The best way to explain this is with an example. Allow me to set the stage. Your kiddo, Jeannie, is a typical 16-year-old and has gone out for the night with friends. They picked her up around 7, and she has a ride that will get her home in time for her midnight curfew. Her friends hear about a party, but it's at someone's house that Teeny does not like to be around. She's just really not comfortable, and she doesn't want to go to the party. However, the last thing she wants is her friends to think she's being lame or dramatic or even bailing on them. And they're driving her. She's in their car. So now what? Family secret code. Your phone is going to ding with something like, can you please get my whites out of the dryer? A simple sentence. But once you see it, you know to start blowing up her phone with text and eventually a phone call where you're talking and yelling so loudly that everyone can hear you're demanding that she comes home immediately or that you're coming to get her right this minute because she is in so much trouble no room for compromise you are furious and she is coming home right now or is she in trouble can you please get my whites out of the dryer is your family's secret code this message tells you that teeny needs a way out but doesn't want anyone to know that she wants out you've talked about this and you both know exactly what to do your role is the bad guy as far as her friends are concerned and you be that bad guy loudly but you're also her safe exit from a potentially bad situation you're probably thinking, why doesn't she just text you like, hey, come get me or come pick me up. I want to go home. Totally get that. Makes sense. But here's why it doesn't work. Teens are so zoned in on phones, theirs and their friends. Please pick me up text could easily be seen by one of their friends. And the next thing you know, they're being called lame or dramatic or even being accused of bailing. Teens have enough going on. They don't need to feel trapped at events or outings because they don't want to be treated badly or teased for wanting to go home. A secret family code gives Teeny a risk-free way to hit that escape button and you get to be the bad guy and the good guy at the same time. That doesn't happen very often when your kids are teens. Finally, there's the no questions, no consequences call. Yes, you heard that right, no questions no consequences. Imagine if Teeny had decided to stay with her friends that night and go to the party. They show up, are having fun, people are drinking, making out in corners, vaping, maybe even experimenting a little to midnight. And Teeny realizes that her ride home is impaired. And while her friend insists that she isn't that drunk and is totally fine to drive, Teeny although impaired herself, knows that any of them getting in that car is an unbelievably bad idea. Ring, ring. Teeny's on the phone and she tells you she needs you to pick her up and gives you the address. She's making the no questions, no consequences call. 
You get up and you go. Once you reach her, the only question you can ask is, are you okay? And if you end up needing to drive all the friends home, obviously you can also ask for their addresses. The drive will probably be very quiet. Teeny will likely feel embarrassed, guilty, or maybe even a little scared of your potential reaction. Remind her just once that you love her and that this was a no questions, no consequences call, but you're there to listen if she wants to talk. If she does start talking, remember, she is impaired, so just listen. Even when you want to smack her upside the head, just listen. While this no questions, no consequences call was 100% the right thing for Teenie to do, you will have to make it clear the next day that this is not an every weekend thing or even an every other weekend thing, and it is never meant to be their ride home. This is an in case of emergency situation and you're proud of her for knowing when to use it. These three ways of parenting after dark, being the bad guy, having a family code and offering a no questions, no consequences call are such huge wins because you are actually showing them what you have probably said to them a million times. Actions speak louder than words. For years, your kiddo has heard you say that you've got their back, you're in their corner, but now they can actually see you there. They see you in their corner behind them so they can stand tall even when they want to fall. You are building a trust and a bond with your kid that is unlike anything you've ever had. They know they can come to you and not be treated like a little kid. It's actually a huge first step in developing your more adult relationship. And honestly, beautiful. Look, no matter how you do it, parenting teenagers and young adults is hard. And it requires some mysterious combination of patience, understanding, and flexibility. As parents, it's easy for us to get overwhelmed by it all. We have found that focusing on keeping those lines of communication open, being the bad guy, creating our family code, and offering that no questions, no consequences call has been the best way to connect and communicate with our teens and young adults. Thank you for being here, my friend. If you're parenting a teen or about to, I see you and I promise you, you are doing an amazing job. Chocolate covered pretzels are the best sweet and salty snack and they're perfect for those late night chats. They used to take a lot of time and energy, but not anymore. Here's my accessible and easy peasy way to make this delicious snack. Spread your pretzels out on a parchment lined baking sheet and top with your melting wafers. Here I'm using white chocolate, but this works with dark chocolate or milk chocolate as well. Bake at 200 degrees for five to seven minutes, remove it from the oven and let them cool. That's it, so easy. No more constant melting or dipping and you can decide how much chocolate you wanna include by putting one wafer per pretzel or covering the whole top. If you actually have any leftover, you can store it in an airtight container for about a week or so. I hope you enjoy these as much as we do. Thank you for being here, my friend. I'm so glad you were able to join me. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform because you're not going to want to miss the next episode where we're going to talk about how an adjective can never define your motherhood.